I have been shot at <laughs> multiple times in my life for being for what? trespassing. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's crazy. <laughs> yes. Uh, we need to talk about that off air. Holy cow. <laughs> What? Okay. That's that's some that's some Virginia stuff right yeah, there. Yeah, that's some Virginia <laughs> shit right there for sure. <laughs> Yo yo. All right, man. You ready? Here we go. Crack I'm the, the neck. recording. Gonna do the, the stand back, the little little shimmy before we get into the podcast Ugh. episode. Get the blood flowing. Yep. Well, I don't know, man. I feel like I'm more tired than you, and it's only 5 p.m. where I am. <laughs> I don't know. Well, yeah. I've, so I I've been actually using this really interesting app. It's called Time Shifter, and uh, it's supposed to help with jet lag adjustment. And so basically, huh. you tell it like what flights you're gonna be taking and what your sleep schedule normally is, and then it will tell you like a couple days before, like oh, oh go to bed like two hours later, don't see sunlight, don't drink coffee, Dude, it's too and then late, like when you man. get there, <laughs> like you yeah. should have told me this. I, for the record, for to clear up this conversation, uh, Joel is currently in Tokyo uh, for the Hacker One Live hacking event. I will be leaving in about twelve hours <laughs> to go to Tokyo. So, dude, so this app, like, it tells you how to beat jet lag. Is that the vibe? Yeah, I mean, that's the goal. Um, They actually have, like, a partnership with United. So if you have a 1K membership, you mm. get, like, a free year of it or something. Oh, cool. Um, but uh, even still, it's, like, 25 bucks a year. It's, like, really not that bad. Uh, oh. And, yeah, it's been pretty interesting. It's, you know, if you've traveled a lot, it's not anything you're probably not you know, already aware of in terms of like try to go to bed at a normal time, like just trying yeah. to like stay up and take melatonin before you go to bed. And um, the light, I think, is a really big, important thing because yeah, when you when is, you take sure. light into your retinas, it uh, it helps your circadian rhythm adjust. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to have light in the morning and in the evening. Yeah. And that's one of the things that they recommend. And I noticed that helped quite a bit of just like getting light into my eyes and uh, helping wait, sort wait, of just reset my sleep. When you talk sleep. about light in the morning, it makes me think of that little <laughs> that little meme of the eagle, you know, like going on the <laughs> stupid mental, stupid little walk for my stupid mental and physical, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like Very relatable, yeah. <laughs> okay. Like, uh, I have to see light. Uh. <laughs> yeah, we need to, we need to, I guess we need to get somebody to overlay that on the screen. We should note that down, little, little eagle meme. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Nice, man. Well, well. Uh, how's the how's the live hacking event going for you? We're not we're not team critical thinking this time, so I haven't caught up with you at all. How's it going? Yeah, yeah. It's been pretty good. Um, it's been a pretty hard target. I'm not gonna lie. Um, I found a couple things. Did some collaborations uh, with Shubs. So, yeah, nice. we found um, you know, we found one one really interesting thing together. But it's been a pretty tough target. I'm not gonna lie. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people. I don't know. Are we allowed to say who it I is? I know it's kind of public. To say the yes, we are allowed to say the the primary target. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's PayPal. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I know a lot of people. There's a special scope. I'm not gonna say what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's a special scope, and then there's the PayPal scope. And I know a decent amount of people have actually been focusing on the PayPal scope. Oh really? Um, wow. I know. I was speaking with Nagley, and Nagley had some really interesting stuff on the main scope for PayPal. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a really interesting event. I'm excited to see what people are finding. I haven't even checked the leaderboard, board, so I, I, I wonder how many bugs are in and stuff, but, uh, I think it's going to be a cool event. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, it's been a little bit of a tricky one for me too. I've, I've got a, I think I've got a good number of reports that I'm comfortable with and happy with, but it's just dupe Palooza because the, the special scope that they added for this one is like just very very narrow yeah. and not extremely featureful so uh you know you really yep. have to dig deep and you got to find everything and uh yeah it's just i think i out of my 23 reports i think like 18 or 19 are duplicates including wow. all of my bugs above a uh a high and above so i have no well, maybe i might have one i might have one solo high we'll see Okay. But uh, my the crit that I have or the two crits that I have are all dupes, and so it's just like stabbed to the heart. Ugh. Ugh. Damn. Well, if it's a yeah. crit, we'll we'll have to see. I I was speaking with Nagley, and apparently because of the way that this whole account setup works, and I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. They might be doing privilege required low at minimum for everything. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's kind of. 
kind of annoying, kind of frustrating. Yep. I it's don't think mad. personally. It's kind of personally. Mad. I don't think that it. That yeah. I know they had some like special stuff in the back end. I think when we were signing up to make it so we didn't get flagged as spam. So maybe mm. that's why you know you actually do need a little bit of privileges required. It's not as simple as just like signing up for your own account. Um, yeah, but, uh, maybe yeah. we'll see. We'll see at the event, man. You know, n not trying to you know toot my own horn or anything here, but your boy has some persuasive skills. And then, yeah, you know, okay. Put put me put hey, me in front of could, the team. If you could swing I'll... it for the whole team, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be clutch. That'd be clutch. Cool. All right. Um, so we got a bunch of questions. I think that uh, yeah. we were gonna go over. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's take a peep um, at these. Uh, we're keep trying to keep this episode pretty chill today, since Joel and I are both in the middle, in the throes of a live hacking event. So we went back and looked at. Uh, Twitter post from a while back when we were giving away the Kaido Pro subscription um, and kind of grab some questions off there for us to kind of discuss. Um, let's do, let's go ahead and start with our boy Jubobs uh, and let's talk about Awesome. does bug bounty hunting unconditionally qualify as ethical hacking, do you think? <laughs> so I think... <clears throat> I think Jubob's coming in with the hard hitting questions, man. Like okay. these, these are some serious questions. So the thing is, when you call it bug bounty hunting, I think that kind of implies, at least the way that I understand it, that kind of implies that you're hacking on a bug bounty program. And to me, when I think about it that way, mm -hmm. that implies also that you are complying with a program policy. And so theoretically, mm -hmm. most of the time it's ethical hacking. I think we both know that safe harbor isn't foolproof and there are certainly edge cases and well, not even edge cases, there are cases where you will mm, be going sure. out of safe harbor if you, you know, do, do certain things. Right. So if you do bug bounty hunting and you extort the team, that's not ethical hacking. Right. Mm -hmm. Like asking right. for, you know, do this or I'm going to release the data or, or I'm going to keep the data. Like yeah, yeah, any, yeah. anything like Absolutely. that, I don't consider that ethical. So I think there are, <clears throat> there are certainly lines that you can cross to make it non-ethical, but from like a baseline standpoint, just reporting a bug to, to a bug running program, that's absolutely ethical in my opinion. So I have a little bit of a differing opinion on this and it's going to be interesting okay, let's hear it. because it, it also kind of toes the boundary of what I was talking about last week, which was it's, it's not our responsibility to define a company's threat model for them, but I would feel a little bit yucky about reporting something that is that the company wanted to receive that I know full and well is technically impossible to exploit. So uh, I, I've got a good example of this, okay? So let's say um, I, I got a bunch of, I don't know why lately, but I, I get a bunch of DMs and lately a lot of people have been asking about um, access control origin star header, right? Uh, you know, okay. access with, uh, you know, uh, asterisk origin plus right. the allow access any, control credentials. Call. Exactly. Plus the access control allow credentials true header. Those two, okay. those two things together. Uh, uh, theoretically, what this, what should happen with this is that you're allowed to send cookies and then any origin allow is allowed to read the response. Right. But yep. goals. The people that goals. Defined, yeah. The, the, the people that defined the spec thought, hey, this is dumb. We shouldn't allow them this to happen. <laughs> um, and uh, and they said, hey, this is this is not going to be exploited. We're not we're not going to make this. You can't use the access control credentials true with the asterisk origin. Um, and so, okay. uh, you know, people are messaging me like, hey, how do I exploit this? And I'm telling them, hey, this is not exploitable, even though it's clearly a misconfiguration. Like those headers cannot be working together you know, well, it, it, they, they just don't work together. It causes an error. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you were to report that, right, and the team were to accept it, and you know that the team accepts that, let, let's say you, you reported it when you didn't know whether it was a bug or not, and the team accepted it and paid it out. Then you found another one, but you now you know that it is not, uh, it is not an exploitable bug. Yeah. Is that ethical hacking or not? Because you're deceiving the company into paying you money. Um, what do you think? So from the per from like a program perspective, the way that I would view this mm -hmm. is that, well, for one, it would be hard to pay that out except for like a low or maybe a low end of medium. And the reason for that is that it, it, you shouldn't pay it out at all. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean, so, so well, here, here's why I might consider paying it. 
And the reason is that it's a security misconfiguration, okay. right? And so the reality is mm -hmm. that like, is something wrong? Yes. Is it exploitable right now? No. Would it be ex exploitable in certain edge cases? Potentially, right? Like maybe you could exploit it in an older browser or uh, di like certain browser. I don't know, right? Like th there might be certain edge cases mm -hmm. where, it's, where it's possible. And I think the fact that it's there and written and shown, like all it takes is one slip up for that to go wrong. Um, but it's not exploitable, right? Like, like you said. And so I think that right. is a huge mitigating factor that like almost nullifies your bounty essentially because what's the yeah. security impact? Nothing. But what's the security right. issue? Something. And so I think it's kind of towing the line between a bug and not a bug. I could see like 50, 50, whether or not the program wants to accept it or not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I would, I, but would I think it's ethical. I, you think it's ethical, even though even though you know that there is no possible way for it to be exploited. I think the ethics are the same for the program as it is for the reporter, whether or not they want to accept it and pay it out. Or like if the program says, I'm not going to accept this, that's kind of the same ethical decision in my mind as the reporter reporting it again, even though it's not exploitable. Because not, not the program you. is accepting, well, the program is accepting something that's not valid and the re researchers submitting something that's yeah, but, not valid but the program in this scenario the program doesn't know that right the program doesn't know oh, that this okay is not that's a that's a big order, caveat if the if right. the program doesn't know that it's not exploitable well first yeah. of all that's a problem this shouldn't stop <laughs> a triage right like yeah, it, it should, triage should see this and be like i can't exploit this and it yeah. probably should never even make it to the team if the team yeah. it either doesn't have triage or they decide to accept it anyways that uh mm, if they don't mention it, like I, I feel like somebody should mention it. Right? Here's, here's like, another here's another fringe case, right? Let's say you have an injection of a URL of a JavaScript URL into an an A tag with the uh, target blank attribute set, right? It, and somebody clicks that link, it won't trigger in the browser because uh, you cannot trigger JavaScript URLs on on uh, uh, underscore blank target blank. Um, a, 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 a HTML yeah, yeah. tags, <laughs> couldn't get that out. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, that's not exploitable, but like you said, they're one, uh, deleting one attribute away from an XSS, but you know that that's not, not, you know, exploitable. So is it ethical for you to report that or not? So I think that is a little more of a clear cut case in my mind than mm. the headers, because the headers are very explicitly like, mm -hmm. you're setting a header in your response, this is configured incorrectly. Mm -hmm. The fact that just like being able to put a URL in an element, but that's not exploitable. I don't. Well, yeah, I don't know. I'm going back and forth. It's tricky, like, Ed. It's not, well. I guess. I guess. Yeah. To, in order to in order to devil's advocate my own point, right? I guess I would say that there's nothing really. There's nothing unethical about seeing whether something meets the criteria that a company has for their threat model um, for their organization, right? And, and yeah. I guess it, it definitely has to be, uh, I think the rub is where how you describe the issue in your report, right? Like, are you saying, hey, you know, click this link and you'll get an XSS and then you actually don't. And you're like, oh, some browser restriction, blah, 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 should work in other browsers, blah, 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 blah. Or are you saying like, hey, this isn't exploitable in any active browsers, but I thought you might want to know because you guys are very close to making a bad mistake. Right. And I think transpa transparency is like the biggest thing mm -hmm. here from both sides. Right? Yeah. And so like as a researcher, if this is something you're going to report, be ready for the program to not accept it. Like just, mm -hmm. you know, test the waters though. I think that like what, what you suggested there is a good idea. Submit it, see how they react, see if this is something they care about. Some, some security teams care about misconfigurations like this a lot and mm -hmm. they'll accept it and they'll pay it yeah. um and like a security issue is a security issue even if it's not fully exploitable i respect that um you know but i think it's really up to each program to decide how they want to handle that and if it's something they want to say sorry this is an informative um and then they fix it i also don't really have a problem with that because mm -hmm. In most, like if in most cases, if you reported something to a bug bounty program, I could understand you getting frustrated if they they closed it and then they fixed it anyways. But this yeah. is not exploitable, and so 
it's really more just you're letting them know that this is a thing. Yeah. And if they want to like toss you some points or like uh, you know a small bonus bounty mm -hmm. or swag or something like that, I, I think that's more than reasonable. Depending yeah. on again, depending on the program, but I, I there's not really talk, a great clear cut I, I, case I'm for it. I'm a little bit. I'm a little bit. Uh, it's a little bit interesting to hear you talk about uh, maybe potentially maybe paying uh, bounties for things that are not fully exploitable. I. Uh, might have to give uh, your program a try sometime. <laughs> uh oh, now I'm gonna have to go and look at all the security misconfigurations. No, you're good, man. Um, yeah, Jubobs, thanks for the question, man. I think that that's a that's a good one. And um, the only other scenario that kind of pops into my head about whether or not, uh, like, it's ethical for for us to participate in a bug bounty program in all scenarios is this case of lying about severity as well. Um, and, 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 you know, we have a friend, I think, you know, what friend I'm talking about <laughs> okay. that, that, that always like just goes very, and I'm not sure, I'm not saying he's lying about the, I'm sorry, they're <laughs> lying about the, uh, the uh -oh. severity of the bug. Um, but like, it's definitely strongly worded, right? And I have yeah. a little bit of an ethical thing about this because at the end of the day, like the people on, on the triagers on, on the security teams and stuff like that, they're seeing a lot of reports, you know, um, oftentimes they're not, they're not the ones that are also doing the offensive hacking. Right. So they're not as you know intimately familiar with the details of, um, the boundaries of all of these bugs. And so, yeah. you know, pulling a fast one on these guys to gain a buck or two is I think, in, uh, unethical. So. Un ineth yeah, unethical, I'll agree unethical, with you on that. Unethical. Yeah. Yeah, unethical. Yeah, I think um I think everybody, especially people who hack a lot and mm -hmm. like full time and that kind of stuff, this is a really tricky and easy hole to fall into. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because when you're submitting stuff, like you don't really want to, <clears throat> you know, toot your own horn too much. But at the same time, you also want to like you know, critical information being leaked like you know you want to like, sell it i mean you, you gotta you yeah. want to get your report attention you know exactly so yeah. like there, i think there's a line between like you want it to to be like this is like to demonstrate that there's impact here so the team doesn't under play it but also mm -hmm. you, you know you don't really want to be like you know i don't i don't like lying to programs mm -hmm. but i don't think like i think if you have to lie and you're like being dishonest i think that's kind of where I draw my personal ethical boundary of like, yeah. where is this ethical hacking and like, where is this not ethical hacking? Mm. Um, and the reality is that if the like triagers in the programs and everybody is doing their job properly and they read through the report properly, they should see through that still mm -hmm. and they should pay it appropriately. And if you as a hacker have a problem with that, that's not really yeah. the, the program's fault. Well, I, I, I also think here's another, here's another scenario that, that I've kind of felt a little ethical quandary on before is like, I don't know, man, like clearly this is not an ethical problem, but I feel really bad about sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I feel bad about reporting bugs that will just clearly never, ever, 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 ever be exploited. Like, like, and they are bugs and they're valid, you know, let's say access control bypasses or whatever, but like, I cannot even fathom a world in which some attacker would be like, <laughs> I'm gonna like, unsubscribe you from these email notifications, you know, like, you know, I'm not like, gonna try to get too doomer I, about this because you can, I mean, you could really extend this to like every small program and be like, who's even using this thing? Like, oh, no, that's true. Yeah. But, you know, but yeah. I, I think like, you know, a bug's a bug, you know, bug bounty is kind of a game. Yeah. We've talked about this. There's a lot of meta aspect to how you report stuff and, all that kind of stuff. So mm. I, I don't know. It's a it's a very tricky. It is true. Um, it's a very tricky line to to figure out where that is and how you should be reporting stuff and mm. what's ethical and what's not ethical and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So scope, right? That's the other thing that Jubab mentioned in their comment. Um, is it ethical to go out of scope to attack an in scope asset? Yeah. Ugh, okay. okay. So actually, I'll, I'll take first take on that one while, while you think. Um, I'm going to say no. And the reason for that is that it's technically illegal. 
Um, and, and, and so even though you're, you have goodwill and you have good intent and you know, you're not going to, you know, weaponize these vulnerabilities to attack anyone else. Uh, the fact that you are hacking a system that you are not authorized to hack that crosses an ethical boundary that, that it's kind of like, to me, it's kind of like trespassing, right? Like you, you, you're not going to, you know, break anybody's house or like, you know, cut down somebody's trees or something. But if you're walking through their property for, uh, you know, a period of time, that's, it's not hurting anybody, so to speak, but it is technically illegal. Um, and that's why yeah. I would say going out of scope, uh, is not, is not a good, not a good practice. And, and I think there are some scenarios where I, I will say, I've seen programs do this sometimes where they'll say, Hey, um, star.site.com is, uh, is in scope but not eligible for bounties um and then and then but you know www.site.com is eligible for bounties and in those scenario since it's technically in scope you can hack on that all you want and then try to use that to affect www i think that's a really good configuration yeah um this is one of those really tricky cases and again this is going to be program by program um it's just you know I have to like, say, I'm pretty proud of that trespassing analogy too. You know, yes, like, that's, a, that's a great that's, analogy. That's good, like, right? I, like, <laughs> yes, yeah. Like, I think that's a great analogy. Like, I, man, it's so hard because, like, I think all programs should be paying for impact, right? And yeah, that means that going out of scope to provide impact on the main scope is still impact on the main scope. However, just like you said, it's going out of scope, and that by definition is like violating the program terms mm -hmm. and like yep. doing things that you shouldn't be doing. And so, uh, you know, it's again, it's kind of one of those cases where if you submit something like this, don't be surprised that the program's like, hell no, <laughs> this is absolutely yeah. not. We're not going to accept this like this, yeah. you know, and you shouldn't have done that. And you're lucky we're not banning you. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I, I think that like the program has every right to be frustrated and mad. If you do that, on the other hand, impact is impact and if you can show some really solid like if it's a critical i i think as a security team i would have a hard time being mad if it was a third party because it's a critical mm, like if yeah. you can provide critical impact to my program even if it's a third party one of the things you have to realize for, for, as a security program is that the relationships that you have with your third parties and the way that you handle accounts and data and all it's that kind of stuff sharing with third parties is your responsibility as a security team it's not just like oh th it's, that's the third party now like, like we're you know, totally wiped clean of our liability here. No, like your, you know, data and whatever is still involved there. So mm -hmm. you should still own that to some extent. But this, I think, goes back a little bit to like the whole zero day, like should you report a zero day to a program and yeah. that kind of stuff? And where does the responsibility lie for bounty? And should they pay for it and all that kind of stuff? And like, it, it's a very tricky scenario. Like, I think at the end of the day, the security team is still probably going to reach out to that third party and they're going to get it fixed and they're going to figure out how to fix it from their side so that it's not creating that impact on the main program mm -hmm. or on the main scope. Yeah. But as a hacker, you are definitely crossing some lines there and you're opening yourself up to some risk by going out of scope and reporting something that's out of scope and explicitly, mm -hmm. you know, kind of violating some, some boundaries and, and some rules in order to get that critical. Okay. So yes, I hear that. And it actually makes me think of a better analogy for the, oh, for the okay. trespassing. Okay, so okay. this time I'll, I'll take my no trespassing sign down. This time we're <laughs> trespassing, right? But we're doing. Oh, I'll it, put it back up. We're, we're doing it to save a cat. <laughs> oh, I mean, well, right? say less. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm sorry, not a cat, <laughs> a dog. <laughs> no. Well, um, I, what's wrong with cats? No, 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 <laughs> I just no, actually, actually, I told you that I'm no longer allergic to cats, right? Uh, yes, apparently. Dude, I I am I'm free of my lifelong allergy to cats, and I pet a cat for the first time in my life the other day, and it was That's like so crazy. It was lit, man. Anyway, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put it back to a cat. We're trespassing on the property, but we're doing so to save a cat, right? Okay. How does that feel, right? Like that feels that feels. Okay, maybe even even more accurate would be we're trespassing on a property looking for a person's lost cat. Right, because because at the end of the day, when we're bug hunting, we don't know that we're going to find a bug. But if we do find a bug, we are helping that 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 program. We are finding that person's cat. Um, sure. And so, I'm going to use an America analogy here. Okay, <laughs> so 
in America, <laughs> if you were to do this, you're gonna get shot. You also have. <laughs> Yes, exactly. That's exactly where I was going. 50-50 chance, right? Like right. that homeowner has every right. You're on their property. You're on private property. You're trespassing. Like you didn't ask permission. For all of they you that don't right. live in America, it's not actually a 50-50 chance, but there is definitely a <laughs> yeah. non-zero chance that you'll be shot at. I have been shot at multiple times in my life for being, for what? trespassing. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's crazy. <laughs> yes. uh, we need to talk about that off air. Holy cow. <laughs> What? Okay. That's that's some that's some Virginia stuff right yeah, there. Yeah, that's some Virginia <laughs> shit right there for sure. Um, but yeah, no, I think like okay, in the same way that like the homeowner or whatever has the right to defend their property and like tell you to get get the hell out of there. Same thing for the program, right? Like they have the right to say this is not in scope. We're not going to accept this. Get the hell off my property. Right? Mm, like, right. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And um, you know, as a researcher, don't be surprised if that happens that's kind of the risk that you're accepting by submitting that stuff. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it, it, you can't play stupid in these, in these situations as a researcher. Like you def you definitely know what you're doing. Like yeah. if you're going out of scope and you're writing up that report, you know, like there's a risk that they're going to say no, or they're going to get mad about sure. that. And you know, that's the, uh, hopefully that's you have a good relationship with the program or hopefully it's a, it's a program that is willing to look past that. Uh, but, you know, there's always going to be the chance of mitigating factors or uh, not accepting it or marking it as N.A. or informative and still fixing it on the back end. Yeah. You know, those are things that I, might happen. I so. will say as well that um, there are some, I guess, caveats being made in Computer Fraud and Abuse Act laws. Um, yep for good faith security research. And so right. uh, I haven't really gone down the rabbit hole lately of what that actually looks like. And especially for like people like us who have an established record as of ethical hacking, I'm not sure if going out of scope would technically be illegal. Um, and if it, if, it, if it is, then that ethical boundary is still there. But if it's not, then yeah. That's not. Yeah, I forget what the exact wording is. It's either yeah. best intent or good or faith, good faith research. security research or something like that. Yeah. I think in terms of legality, uh, now the reality. Let's get into the weeds a little bit. Mm. They, they are. They didn't actually change the CFA. The mm -hmm. Justice Department made a s statement that said this is how you should prosecute the CFA. Oh really? And so, okay. if you're adhering to you know best intent and good faith ethical hacking, then that shouldn't be illegal according to the CFAA mm. and it shouldn't be charged. Sweet. But that I think that's separate from bug bounty, right? Like in terms of ethics, I don't know, like you're, everybody's ethics are different. In terms of legality, it's probably legal, unless, at least in the US. And in terms of validity for eligibility for a bounty, well, um, well what if, what if know, it's against my ethics to do something illegal? Well, that's a personal choice. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, cool. Cool. Well, today we're kind of we're kind of just you know screwing around. So I'm going to tell you the story about me getting shot at because it's pre it's okay. a pretty great story. Okay, so I grew up in Virginia, and like a couple hundred yards. Now it's probably like a mile actually. Um, behind my house, there was this really awesome waterfall, like 20 foot waterfall. Um, okay. massive waterfall built by slaves in the civil war. And, um, oh, and pretty cool. And so it was had like, you know, it was flowing water, very beautiful area, but it was on somebody else's property. <laughs> and, and so, uh, but it was very far from their house, right? Like, okay. it, you know, it like you could barely see their house in the distance. Right. Okay. So I, so oh, it's on their property. It, it is definitely, it is definitely on their property. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, you know, being the kid that I am, I've snuck out there a couple times and, you know, enjoyed the beautiful view. How old were you at this point? Well, okay, hold on. Like, let's, let's, <laughs> <laughs> let, let's, let's hold off on that one. Um, so we, <laughs> so, you know, get Justin arrested. <laughs> when, when I was a kid, I used to go out there often, right? So, but this time that I'm talking about that I got shot at, I was, I was a teenager. Let's just say, you know, not a, a young teenager. And okay. um, I was going to go on a picnic with my girlfriend. Uh, ah. And so my girlfriend and I were walking, you know, through the woods. I had made like this little like basket and it was all cute and everything. And we're <laughs> like, you know, walking to the waterfall. It's going to be so fun. And then um, all of a sudden I just hear shots ringing out of, over our head. Holy right? shit. And, and I look across the lake 
And I see like very, very far away. I mean, the person is like this small at this point, but they're standing okay. on their deck with a gun and we uh. just like book it back the other way <laughs> and move our picnic to the middle of the woods that was on my property. Holy but cow. I was... You still did the picnic? Oh yeah, we did the picnic. We're not about to let a good, you know, ham sandwich go to waste. No, sir. No, a sir. Little bullet doesn't, doesn't stop my ham no, sandwich. No, no. I still had, still was hungry, man. Um, so, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah well, this is a little bit of an, a little bit of an off off brand critical thinking episode, but you know, such as life. What a, what a wild uh, little childhood experience there! Yeah, Holy man. cow, it's kind of crazy. Um, all right, let's see if there's any of these any other um questions on here that looked good. Eh, you could you could run them through real quick. How to set up a mobile intercept proxy? That kind of I feel like that kind of, yeah, yeah. just talk them through that real quick while I figure out sure. some other stuff. Yeah, so typically what I do, regardless of whether or not it's an emulator or, or a physical device, um, if it's a physical device, plug it in. Um, but either way, you just want it to show up on ADB and have debugging enabled. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you just do ADB reverse TCP colon 8080, TCP colon 8080. And what that will do is it creates a, a tunnel between your host and the device um, on port 8080. And so that means that any traffic that's going to port 8080 on the device will get tunneled to port 8080 on your host machine. Mm -hmm. And that's seriously the easiest, like most straightforward, foolproof way that I've found to proxy. You don't have to worry about network conditions. You don't have to proxy to an, an IP address. You literally proxy to 127.0.0.1, yeah, port 8080. It goes over ADB, it tunnels, and there's no connectivity concerns or anything like that it's it's great so so then you just go into the mobile app um or the the mobile devices uh wi-fi settings yeah the wi-fi settings set up the the proxy to point at localhost yep. 8080 yeah just edit your network proxy manual host 127.0.0.1 port 8080 and yeah it should work that easy you should be able to you know just navigate to like burp in your browser if you mm -hmm. want to get the ca cert um yeah. all that stuff should just work so yeah and then and then the easiest way to download the ca cert like you said is just hit uh localhost 8080 they'll see you'll see a little ca cert uh button up at the yep. top right hand corner on the burp you click that download the cert sometimes you have to rename it to dots yeah uh, -E to crt yeah or crt yeah um, yeah either of those from dot der and then you, you just yeah. go into your security settings trusted cert uh trusted credentials ca certificates, CA certificates. install one and uh, you just select it from your SD card and, and then boom, it's good done. to go. That's the easy part, though, because most applications <laughs> are implementing cert pinning. So for that, True. you're going to need some some uh, some Frida uh, yeah. SSL some pinning secret bypassing sauce. secret sauce, which, yeah. I, which we talked yeah. about, I believe, on... We did. What was that episode? That was an early one, I think. Uh, 14? Yeah, I think it was like 12, 12 14, 12? 12 or 14. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it up right now. Uh yeah, Fort man, your boy remembers numbers, man. Yeah, uh, twelve was 14. LA life hacking. Is it twelve was Jay Haddix? Oh, uh, man. Okay, you yeah, got the, you got this better than I do. <laughs> LA life hacking was seventeen. Oh okay, wow, I'm yeah. way off. Cool, but yeah, no, it's it's that easy. Um, mm -hmm. you know, very straightforward. And uh, I think during the mobile episode we actually talked about the free to unpinning. I have a mm -hmm. universal quote unquote universal mm -hmm. um unpinning script. Yeah, always that, works for uh, me that is linked there and that works like 98% of the time yeah, for me. You can link that in the description as well. Let me, let me cool. write that down. Eagle, Eagle meme and then uh, cert pinning script. Okay, so um, next topic that I, so I, I kind of scrolled through these. Not gonna lie, dude, there wasn't a lot of great questions. So <laughs> come on, critical thinking listeners, give us something deep. Like there, there, there's a bunch yeah, of people saying- Could you think saying, critically? Like, God. Could you just think like, <laughs> think critical, okay? Um, <laughs> uh, so one of the ones that kept on popping up was how do you, how do you approach a new target? What's the first stuff you look at? What's your process? And what kind of steps do you do before you start hacking? Um, and I wish that we could give you a recipe, but there's not really a recipe. So um, yeah. it really depends on the target. Uh, for me, a lot of the time, I try to figure out what the app is and how to use it like a human. Um, and so for me, that often means logging into the application, navigating around, reading documentation, 
um, kind of keeping a general eye on the architecture of the application, uh, trying to understand whether it's like a single page app uh, or whether you know you've got they're using a front end framework like React or Vue, what their back end looks like, are there a bunch of different APIs, are there microservices, their GraphQL, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I also look at auth a decent bit. So um, uh, at OAuth, at the two-factor authentication flow, um, any sort of alternative authentication paths like uh, like like one-time password being sent to your email, you know, and you just click kind of click that link and it logs you in like Slack does. Um, those sort of things are are um, are pretty 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 pivotal to my method methodology, but it it very much varies uh, with every single target. Yeah, for me, so I think there's a couple like core steps that I like to follow, and it generally depends on like where I'm at within the process of looking at that target. So when I'm starting out, like from the very beginning, a lot of it is like what you said. It's figuring out what is this app, what is it supposed to do, where where are sort of like the natural boundaries in terms of uh, what functionality should be, where are their access controls, kind of identifying those no's like, mm -hmm. uh, like Archangel yeah. was speaking about in, yeah. in the last episode. Um, and then from there, if they have a mobile app, um, a lot of times I'll be looking at that and just see what activities do they have exposed, what are the intent filters, what what kind of functionality exists from like an external attack surface perspective on this on this app? Uh, is there any like weird JavaScript interfaces, any web views, any content providers, any of that kind of stuff? Um, and I'll usually do a bit of a deep dive on the mobile app and just like see if there's any funky stuff that I should be poking at and trying to exploit. Mm. If I don't really find anything there, um, one of the things I do like to do is look for API endpoints within the mobile app and just see is it different from the, if there's like a web app, assuming that is it different from that? What is the auth structure look like? How do you log in mm -hmm. through the mobile app? All that kind of stuff. Um, and then if I'm kind of hitting like a, a wall, I'd like to split and sort of do recon or do like more breadth searching mm -hmm. what where other I'm trying apps? to find new, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like what services exist, subdomains, things that are in scope that I haven't looked at that I might not know about. Um, are there any weird URLs or things that are provided in API responses from mm -hmm. the mobile app or from the web app that I haven't looked at? Um, those are the types of things that I want to take, you know, a little bit of a closer look at and see if there's some bugs that I haven't found or that I, you know, might be easy wins. Mm. Um, and then I kind of just repeat that, like, you know, mm -hmm. look for something, find mm -hmm. something, figure out what the functionality is, Iterate on dig. It. If you run out of things to dig at, try and move laterally and find some other you know, or horizontally or whatever, and try and find new things to look at and, yeah. you know, rinse and repeat. Kind of grasping for for straws right now, man, it, with this application that we're hacking, because it's like <laughs> yeah. the, the scope is so small and I've, and I've exhausted all of it. You know, all of the attack vectors that I can think of over the past week, um, you know, I've tried them. Uh, and, yeah. and so I'm really kind of going back over, reiterating. Um, I'm reaching, reaching for some really crazy bugs in like tangentially related third party libraries that could result in vulnerabilities. Um, yeah. So it's, it's definitely, that's definitely a part of the grind is learning how to push through those scenarios when you're like, ah, I'm out of attack vectors, but yeah. oftentimes it's a that's really when tricky the good scope. stuff pops up. I mean, for me, like, especially for this event, like mm -hmm. the way that they have the scope structured has made it very difficult for me to like want to submit is everything I get, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like I'll, I'll find something and be like, Oh, that's kind of interesting, but I don't even want to like dig into it because it'll be on like a domain that's either explicitly listed as ineligible for bounty or it's not in scope. Like the way that they have this scope structure, I, mm. you know, I don't know if you're looking at it, but it's yeah. very particular. Yeah. And it, so that has really limited the hacking that I've chosen to do for this event. Mm. And I think I'm kind of holding myself back here a little bit because of that. We, but... should, we should compare notes on that after this, because I think there are some ways around a lot of that because of what okay. you kind of mentioned before about like having impact to the main domain and, and, and PayPal is really, is really good about that. If you can show okay. impact, you know, um, to to the primary application to the primary target, then I think you've got I think you've got some good some good bolts there. Okay, um, cool. Yeah, let's compare notes after. Yeah, for sure. Um, sweet. Uh, yeah. What? So this next one was what? What kind of steps did you take before you start hacking? I think I think the only other thing I wanted to add to this one was um, 
like really we talk about this all the time, but like I get so much out of reading documentation and it's going to be dry at first. And, you know, so you're going to sit there and you're going to be like, why am I reading this? Uh, but re read the main apps documentation and read the developer portal documentation because that's going to yeah. give you so much insight into the application. And actually I missed multiple very critical bugs at this live hacking event because I didn't read literally every single page of the Same. of the developer uh <laughs> section um and had i had i read it i would have absolutely found them uh but i missed it so sucks man it, it happens. sucks it, it happens it sucks. um all right so uh before we bounce i've got three little three little things three little cool things and then i guess we can also uh, we were also going to go over the reports weren't we yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so I'll make these quick. Uh, all right, number one, uh, two tweets from your boy, Rhino Reader. Uh, I just wanted to shout these out because these are kind of surprising <laughs> to me that, that some of these, that one the of these- you introduced that was like as if it was a guest, but it's no, just it's you. me. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, from, from this from, awesome, from the man, unheard of hacker the before. Man, the legend. <laughs> Me. <laughs> Me. <laughs> no. Um, uh, you know, so here's the thing, man. Like, and I'm sure you get this all the time as well, but like I get tagged in like five to 10 Twitter posts a day and I get uh, saying like, hey, run Raider and then like spam a bunch of other popular bug bounty hackers. Um, how do I exploit this thing? Right. And I, I try to respond to them if I can. Um, and so last, last, uh, I guess two weeks ago, almost now, somebody was like, hey, I found an open redirect, but it only allows Google and target.com, not other websites. What should I do? How can I exploit this? And so I commented on it because I knew the answer. And the answer is Google has a built in open redirect that uh, they don't patch that is just a part of functionality for Google. And that is google.com slash amp slash s and then your target domain. Mm. If you go to that, it will mm, redirect you to the page target reloads. domain. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so uh, it's just funny because- Does it, that work on mobile? It, I believe it does, yes. Um, okay, because normally AMP pages, like I, that behavior is typically restricted to mobile. So I'm curious if it behaves a little bit differently if, oh, really? if you have like a mobile user agent and stuff. Let's see um, if we can uh, simulate that real quick. Yeah, for those who don't know, AMP pages are essentially no. It does uh, not work be, like, mobile for mobile. Okay, yeah, for there mobile, you go. So it, it doesn't do that. Yeah, so mobile typically the way that this works is that there's these AMP pages. I forget what it what it like stands for, but it's it's meant to be basically mobile friendly versions of pages. You see it a lot with uh, news websites, especially like, mobile like, pages. Yeah, yeah. So it's really meant to be like a a simplified mobile friendly version of whatever page you're looking at again i, I see it a lot with um journalism and news mm -hmm. websites like art news articles and stuff uh but typically if you try and visit an amp url on desktop it does what you said it, it redirects you so that's probably why that's happening is that it detects you're on mobile and it goes oh let me try and render an actual amp page and if you're on desktop it goes oh just well, go to the main go page. back to the, the main page. Wow, yeah. very interesting, Joel. Uh, I didn't know that. That that that's helpful to know why that actually works. Um, yeah, yeah. So that if you're looking for a chain for your open redirects, that's the one. It was really funny because like they like this guy tagged me in this post. I commented on it, and then like that comment <laughs> got more retweets and likes than like my normal <laughs> Twitter post. So I was like, wait a second, what the yeah. hell is going on here? Um, uh, that's a good one though. I, that's yeah. a really that's a really clever attack scenario, especially mm -hmm. for like desktop clients. Yeah, to um, chain it. To be, yeah. 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 Very um, cool. The other thing was I was exploiting an XSS the other day. Tweeted about it. So if, uh, if you guys haven't seen that, you can go check it out. But um, I just wanted to mention it on the pod as well because it's a nice little tidbit. Um, I was getting sort of uh, stopped by the X content type options no sniff header when I was trying to change a CRLF into an XSS. So, you know, you're you're adding the the break, then you're adding the content body, you're providing content length, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, for some reason I couldn't I, I in the scenario I, the content type header had to be blank uh, or else it would it would break it. Um, and mm -hmm. if, if you try to do if you do content type blank, it's going to try to sniff it normally, but uh, in in the scenario they had the no sniff header. So, mm -hmm. so uh, I actually added another no sniff header with an invalid value. And if you have mm. two no sniff uh, 
content type options headers uh, in one of them with an invalid value, one of them with a valid value. Chrome just throws the whole thing out the window. And yeah, I was going to say yeah. like potentially for the even just for the content type providing mm -hmm. two values of it, one should I mean that leads to some kind of unanticipated behavior with how it's going to behave. So yeah, yeah, it definitely does. And it, the reason we couldn't overwrite the content type was because the the uh, CRLF was in the path, and you couldn't put oh. a slash in it. So you can't do HT, you know, text slash HTML, right? So we couldn't override mm. the content type to to be a text, uh, uh, an HTML content type. We tried everything we could think of for that. You have to have a slash. So we said, all right, what about a blank content type and then HTML yeah, sniffing, that's and that's how we got how we popped it. But I was just really surprised okay. to see the X content type options uh, header. If you provide two of them, it's just like you know what? Actually, we just give up. We don't know what to do. And then it just yeah. I'm also surprised that that's from a client side. Like you, yeah. you'd think that would be more of just like a server side control that would d you know do that if it didn't detect something or you know. Yeah. Well, it's the browsers. Whatever, you know, it, the header is the response header is for the browsers. Uh, you know, it tells the browsers whether to sniff or not to sniff. Um, mm. And so. Uh, Chrome just said, Screw oh, oh, so this is in a response header from this an is in a response not, header. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you meant in like an outbound request that you were no, no, changing no. So the this request. Is CRLF, content type. Uh, we're injecting another X content type options header uh, in the response and trying to trigger the XSS. And in uh, the browser says, all right, I'll sniff that if you give them. Uh, I'll, sn <laughs> I'll sniff that. <laughs> I'll give that a sniff. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I yeah, thought that was good like... enough. Uh, we're, cool. getting, we're getting silly, man. This is what happens when you stare at a screen for 12 hours a day for the past week. Um, okay, last little one. This is actually a trick I used to, to get an ATO uh, uh, at, uh, let's just say recently. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and yeah, at recently. At right. recently. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Joel. <laughs> Um, uh, so essentially this scenario was a scenario you, we really often see, which is, uh, you've got a, a application that is using, uh, like Axios, uh, JS library on the, on the front end to communicate with an API and they're authorizing it. They're authenticating into that API via an authorization bearer header. And that header yep. is just sort of stored in the JavaScript state and not stored yep. in local storage or in a cookie. Right, so okay. if you get an XSS, normally you're gonna you're gonna try to pull your session token out of um, uh, local storage or out of a cookie. Um, right. But in this scenario, you, you can't because it's not stored there. So right. your option is you can go through the OAuth flow, which in this scenario had a bunch of like crazy intricacies with crypto stuff uh, to it. Like you had to generate like a certain length nonce or whatever, and then it had to get passed. It was kind of a pain in the butt. Um, so what I actually did was I created an iframe uh, to the same to same origin page. Um, and then that iframe, when it loaded up, it was going to try to reach out to the API to load data. And I just reached into that iframe and overwrote the uh, fetch uh, function, the window.fetch. And I, I just put my own function in there. I shimmed it, mm. is what it's called, and uh, essentially said, "Okay, anytime they call fetch, call my function, and then and then call fetch. And if that function call has the authorization bearer header in it, then exfil it to the attacker server." So it, it's not a crazy hack, but it is something to know that that is useful um, if you are trying to, you know, if you have XSS, you have the opportunity to overwrite functions like like fetch. Um, or other properties um, within the uh, within the window. Um, not all properties can be overwritten, but uh, most of them can, and you can use that to save yourself some time and and uh, when proving an exploit. Or and sometimes in some cases, like JavaScript sandboxes, you can actually use these to escape the sandbox mm -hmm. and uh, and get arbitrary JS execution. That's super interesting. I'm I'm curious how it, how it's stored in a place where it's inex where it's not in local storage and not in cookies, but would like shouldn't it always be accessible from JavaScript if it's being? I'm sure it is. Set. Um, I, I'm sure you know I could hit like window dot like React state because somehow you know, blah, it's blah, setting blah, blah. it in Axios. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, and it's from within their like you know minified hell that is you know whatever yeah. JavaScript library they were using in the front end, um, and so I just didn't feel like 
freaking traversing the whole you know javascript yes, it's easier object. to set your own function <laughs> <laughs> to, to to find that uh and it took literally like two minutes to write the exploit and uh pulled it out really easy rather than having to do like an oauth you know hijack this like oauth flow and like generate a cryptographically accurate you know nonce yeah. or whatever so i figured i'd mention it because it's a cool little trick and it's it, it's actually, unfortunately, like the coolest thing I've done this live hacking event because all of the <laughs> bugs have been mega boring. They've been like, yeah. at, you know, well, actually, I won't say what kind of bugs they, they <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, you know, they, they have not been very interesting bugs. So yeah, congrats to the PayPal team. You don't have a lot of, you know, crazy, interesting bugs, just boring ones. <laughs> <laughs> congrats for having boring bugs. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, is it do uh, should I talk about my the bug that I had? Oh yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead and go over some bugs. That's always cool. A, it's always a dub. Yeah. So I had um I had a really interesting bug a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I I had talked to you about this because mm -hmm. I think we're both on this program. It's yeah. a private program, so I won't say who it is. But uh, the mobile app was primarily in scope, and I was looking at the mobile app, and there was some interesting functionality, uh, in one of the API endpoint responses. And there was like a JSON object that had a bunch of different configurations, URLs and stuff in it. Mm. And one of them was uh, a .html file, which kind of caught my eye because like a lot of times in modern web app infrastructure, you really don't see like raw .html like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it just seemed like a kind of a weird endpoint. And I was like, huh, I, like, I wonder what that is. And so I like, I went to it and it rendered like some very strange stuff. And there was like this login functionality where you're supposed to like log in so it can get your account. And then you can uh, do, you know, app functionality to schedule something is what, I, is what I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I was like poking at it and I was like, huh, this is really weird. But I wonder like if this is actually being used. Cause every time I would try and exploit it, like I would, click login and it would send me to a different page. I was like, huh, this is like, this is kind of weird. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe this is just like a dev environment or something. So I go, I log yeah. in and I, it takes me to like the main page. And I notice like very, very similar to the .html that I was looking at embedded within the page. I was like, huh, okay. So I look and it's an iframe. Um, hmm. And it's, it's an iframe from a different URL, but it's rendering essentially the same thing as that .html. And so as I kept digging, uh, I realized that it does post message communications to talk back and forth because it's embedded within an iframe and it has to pass authentication from the main site into this iframe. And so I was like, huh, I wonder how that works. Like, how is it, like what's actually triggering that to, to you know, send over the auth? Like, is it a certain event? Like, what are the restrictions on that? Could I put my own frame in there? Like, mm -hmm. whatever. So I start digging and sure enough, there's, I mean, the stars really aligned on this one because there's this, functionality for different environments within this iframe and essentially it has a url parameter uh, called override url <laughs> and it, it essentially it checks what? for you know it's supposed to be that if you if you set it to local then it like uses 12700 ah, or something, right sure but they had you know they essentially didn't check if it was you know that you could you could put whatever you wanted in there like if it was just like you know if it's not in the URL, then it just defaults to whatever you've set it to. And Dude. so I could just set it to my own iframe, and then it would embed my iframe in the page. And so then I could send a post message to the inside parent. inside a web view in the mobile app, or is this in, in like, on web? No, so that's the weird thing is, like, it started out from the mobile app, and then it ended up just being a complete web bug. Like, it, I only found that URL and, and the fact that it was iframed and all that from the config endpoint within that mobile app, and then... All, uh, and then I realized, oh, this is like on the main site. It's like a different URL, but the functionality is all the same. Interesting. Um, so yeah, I could set uh, this parameter to my own URL. It would then set the iframe source to that URL, put it in the page, and then you could send post messages to the parent. And there's all these different like commands and stuff. So initially, I just wow. you know I sent the one that it sends sends me the auth token. I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. And then I kept poking, and I was like, oh, there's actually like a lot more functionality in here. And so you could do all sorts of things. Like you could. Um, you could it's ridiculous it, there was actually one action called go to and it would just do window.location equals whatever <laughs> so you could Here's just you know, a second yep. yeah basically a second xss um you could get geolocation through one of the other actions there was like a lot of really interesting functionality but it all just stemmed from this random 
you know, URL that I was like, huh, I wonder what that is. And then uh, when I was trying to log in with it, I realized that it was sending me back to the main page and it was, you know, doing very, very similar functionality, but from a different URL. And uh, the team actually accepted it, which is, which is amazing. That is cool. Uh, technically, I think it was probably would have been out of scope according to the explicit scope that was written down, but it's on the main website and it's mm. account takeover. It's so used by I, the, I, yeah. the, the in-scope asset as well. So Right. Yeah. yeah. So that was a, oh, and I'm looking right now and it seems that they actually added, <laughs> they added the, the main site to the scope. Oh, so did that's they really? Good. It wasn't. Oh, dude. Yeah. 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 So that's dope. We need to go check that but, out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a, that was a really fun one. Um, I've I've actually been enjoying hacking on this program. Uh, you know the one I'm talking about, yeah, but I do. Uh, I do. yeah, they have a uh, they have a, a pretty cool scope, we'll and it's something it that I use personally. The, so, yeah. After the live hacking event in 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 Japan, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, fun, for sure. I, I love post message bugs. Post message bugs are so much fun. I we we talk about them all the time on the pod, but they're essentially APIs for your your you know browser tabs essentially. Yeah. Um. And why would you not want to remotely interact with a, a browser tab? Um, yes, so exactly. Very, very cool stuff there. Um, yeah. Alrighty. My report for the day is uh, also a private program, so I uh, can't really talk about it. But uh, I can tell you the gist of it. And uh, I will say that this uh, chain starts with a XSS. Uh, okay. And it came from none other than Mr. Today is New himself, Eric. So thanks, awesome. for, the, thanks for the assist there, Eric. Um, and... I found this whole whole chain and I had an XSS that had already been reported that I used to exploit the first time they were like dupe because <sighs> uh, you know you you already use the XSS and you can't use it in another ATO chain. And I was like, guys, you're literally putting your users at so much risk right now by not mm. using this. I guarantee you there's another uh, you know, another XSS on your attack surface right now that could be used to exploit yep. this. They didn't accept it. There Dang. we go. Couple, couple, couple weeks later, we do, uh, we do another, um, we do another run of it, and uh, find an XSS. Uh, Eric, Eric finds it in his automation, passes it over to me, and uh, we we exploit the bug. So here's how it works. Um, essentially, what it is is it's taking advantage of uh, sort of a session fixation, but for the password reset, um, and so. What, what you can do is you can use an XSS on star.anything um, and you can uh, take a, a specific session that you can generate and stick it in a cookie and set that cookie to a very specific scope, okay? To the specific path. So um, the way that cookies work in the browser, if you put a cookie at uh, a more specific path than another cookie, even if the domain is wider, that, that cookie will be prioritized when it is sent to the server. So um, let's say you have two cookies with the name uh, you know, session, right? If, if the path that you're on is slash login and one of the cookies is set to slash login and one of the cookies is set to slash, the slash login will be sent first and oftentimes prioritized. And you're saying even if the cookie that's scoped for slash login is set to the star scope. Even, even if it's like specific subdomain dot host.com it'll still override i believe so yes um okay and so uh the only you know i'm actually wondering now whether both of them have to be set to the star scope right or to like dot site.com or whether that, that's interesting i'll have to check that but i know for a fact that if both of them are set to dot site.com then the one with that with the more specific path will be set first uh or okay. will be sent first and so in that sort of way we can uh, get our cookie to pr be prioritized. So then another trick that we can do is we password or we cookie bomb the password reset, um, the password reset flow, um, okay. and, or the, uh, the login flow, excuse me. And when they go to log in, if you cookie bomb that specific path, then the request will fail. Okay. And, okay. uh, because the header size is inflated because of the, all the cookies you sent from the other subdomain. Um, okay. Then when the request fails, it just gives you an invalid password uh, response. Um, okay. And so what, they're, what are they going to do? They're going to reset their password. Um, so they go to the password reset flow. They, they start going through the flow. And uh, when they get to the end of the flow, there's a screen where you can set a new, a new password. Uh, uh, this whole time, they've been using our maliciously set password reset token. Um, okay. And uh, at that point, we, uh, 
use that password reset uh, session to go directly to that page and then we set the password before they can set the password. Um, mm. And then we take over the account. Uh, and Super interesting. That is the that is the account takeover that uses a um, a cookie prioritization trick, uh, uh, cookie bombing, and uh, sort of a session fixation bug. So how did the, how did the program in triage react to it? Because that's kind of like did did it, did it automatically take them to the password reset flow if it failed uh, when you cookie bombed it or no. like during login or. No, okay. I, I they they accepted the attack scenario that if you could figure out a way to tell the pa user that their password is wrong every single time they try to log in, that the next logical step would be to reset their password. Um, okay. So yeah, I so think, it's essentially a DOS that leads them to, you know, reset their password so they can log in because it's saying invalid password or whatever. Login exactly. Failed. Exactly. Because because nice. the login request fails every time because of the the uh, the cookie, the cookie bomb. bomb, and then uh, the password reset flow. Uh, they they go down that path and then we fixated the session for that. So super cool. That's yeah. a super dope bug. Pretty fun bug, right? Yeah, that's awesome. That's a, that's a really interesting one. I'm gonna have to to look for stuff like that. I almost never look for like cookie bombing stuff because it, yeah. it really, it's so case by case. But it and that's a really good instance of it. Yeah, cookie stuff. This, this is another thing that they sort of came to mind when you were talking earlier about what kind of things you um you look for particularly when you. Uh, are starting assessing a program. For me, I always look at the cookies and I look at the authorization um, headers and, and any sort of cool codes that are being thrown around from an OAuth flow or anything like that. Um, it's very important, especially on those websites where you've got like 50 bajillion cookies that are being sent and you don't know which one's the session token. You don't know which one is like sort of yeah. your elevated session token. You don't know which one like tells whether you're not you yeah. should remember the username you know there, there's just so many so many cookies out there and they all just kind of get conglomerated together and so i will give another shout out to something i gave a brief shout out to in the past on critical thinking um, and that is the burp suite plugin called request minimizer uh this has saved me I was so gonna much say, time this is something i yeah this is something that i actually do i i, I wasn't gonna I, I wasn't sure if other people do this and i think yeah i think we've talked about this but i mm. if i'm you know, messing with a request and there's a ton of cookies like that. One of the first things I will do mm -hmm. is I'll go, I'll open the request inspector on Burp and I'll do this manually. I'll just mm -hmm. like open the cookies. I'll select like 80% of them and I'll just delete it. And then I'll just send the request. Yep. And if it succeeds, then it's I'll do like it a again. Binary search, right? <laughs> exactly. And, and if it fails yeah. after the first time, then I know that the cookie that I need is in there. And so then I delete all the other ones. Yep. And then if it still Paste fails, it, delete then I know the other ones. I yeah. two cookies. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's kind of exactly. what I do. But there's a, there's an extension for this you're saying. Yeah, there's a, an extension for this called request minimizer. And essentially what it does is it, just tries to remove everything he possibly can from the request um, and still get the same response. Um, and nice. I use this plugin all the time, really valuable for analyzing what exactly is important in an HTTP request. So I definitely recommend it. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna have to um, I'm gonna have to grab this for my for my burp. Very cool. I'm gonna go ahead awesome. And write this down, dude. I think uh, I think that's it. I think that's a wrap. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. Uh, good little chat get back to live hacking and all that kind of stuff try to get some sleep before yep. you, your flight is it uh is it a direct for you from from virginia yeah, you for sure, man i uh no no it's a it's a one little one one hop up to dc and then a direct to to Haneda. um so yeah nice. not too bad i think it's like 15 okay. hours or 16 hours total not not too bad so cool i'm excited so, man all right do you I'll land on the 13th in, uh, or 14th in tokyo in 15 hours um, okay, 15 hours. Yeah, I land today for you. So. Okay. Yep. Sweet. All right. Well, I'll see you uh, tonight then, I guess. Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. No. I land tomorrow for you. <laughs> because oh, I lose, I guess I'll see you I tomorrow. lose time <laughs> going to Japan. I'll see you tomorrow. All right. Peace. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow. Peace out. <laughs>